my focus is going to be on lung engineering. So about a year ago, I became the CEO of Humicite. And um, so I'm now an adjunct professor at Yale. Um, my lab still runs there, uh, but, uh, but the vast majority of my time is spent uh, in my offices at Humicite, where we're growing engineered vessels. Uh, for clinical use. But I would say that uh, in this talk, I'm not going to focus on vascular engineering, uh, but more on lung engineering. And so the, the content in this presentation really is not related to any clinical products, uh, at least not yet. So I'd like to talk about uh, our, our approach to whole lung regeneration. This is an effort that we started uh, in, in my lab at Yale more than a decade ago. And uh, we, we were one of the first groups to show the feasibility of decellularizing native lung and then repopulating that acellular matrix with cells, lung cells, such that we could reconstitute an organ that could actually participate in gas exchange uh, for a few hours. Um, this report uh, came out in Science in 2010. And uh, frankly, at the time when we showed that we could repopulate an organ and, and achieve uh, gas exchange even for a short period of time, um, I, I was actually flabbergasted that that, that, uh, that, that was possible. Um, but since that time, we've really been working from these initial prototypes and really trying to hammer out some of the, uh, some of the obstacles that stand between us and engineering a lung that can exchange gas in the long term. So um, as I always say to my students uh, and postdocs, you know, it's important when you're, when you're thinking about regenerating a tissue that you want to be functional, it's uh, critical that you think about the, the, the key, uh, what, what we would call design criteria that go into whatever you're going to engineer that, that's going to really drive function. And uh, there are some fun facts about the human lung. Um, you know, the average human lung absorbs about five liters of pure oxygen every hour, which is actually a large volume of gas. Um, and it also excretes a, a similar volume of carbon dioxide every hour. This is accomplished through 200 million alveoli, each of which is about 200 microns in diameter. And uh, with the 23 generations of airway branching, there's actually roughly uh, 70 square meters of surface area in your chest, which is useful uh, for, for gas exchange and which provides this highly efficient gas exchange surface area. But if we think about um, what it would take to reconstitute a, a set of functional human lungs, uh, one of my one of my favorite facts that I that I tend to quote with uh, with stem cell biologists actually is that if we had organoids that we were growing in hydrogels uh, in, and if each of those organoids was 200 microns in size, we would need roughly two million dishes to get enough organoids to reconstitute a, a full human lung. And so clearly. Um, just growing small, uh, small little organoids that represent individual alveoli is, is not going to get us really to a functional organ. So as I mentioned, we have uh, in our early studies, we took acellular lung matrices that we carefully decellularized to really retain the alveolar structure and the microvascular structure. Um, and when we repopulated these organs and then implanted them in vivo, what we found was that the primary failure mode actually was intravascular clotting. So you can see an engineered lung that had been implanted into a rat for several hours on the left. And what you see is that it's sort of this beefy red appearance. And that's because th there was a lot of microvascular inter um, or, and, and intravascular coagulation. So this really led us to think very carefully about the alveolus, which is really the functional unit for gas exchange in the lung. And uh, really, the, the alveoli in your lung are replicated uh, millions of times over, and they're a fairly stereotypic structure. They contain about six or seven different cell types, um, including microvascular endothelium on, on the vascular side of the barrier, um, but also a, a, a collection of fibroblasts, which, which sit in the septae in the wall of the, uh, of the alveoli. And also, they contain... Um, epithelial cells actually of two flavors, type one and type two epithelial cells. And the type one epithelial cells really stretch over the surface of the airway and uh, uh, sit right on the other side of the basement membrane, right next to, to endothelial cells. And uh, I'll show you later on in this talk that we've done some single cell analysis to try to understand 
how these neighborhoods or collections of cells talk to each other in the normal alveolus. But, but just to start, you know, th this just sort of orients you to, to the different types of cells that are located uh, in the air sac. So when we began focusing more on, on providing a, a stable and complete endothelial layer in the vasculature uh, in order to avoid uh, clotting once we implant the lungs uh, into, uh, into na native living animals, uh, we realized uh, at first that, that there's actually two uh, flavors of endothelium, two, two broad flavors of microvascular endothelium in the lung. One is what we call blood endothelium, which it comes in contact with the bloodstream. But another form of endothelium is lymphatic endothelium, which as, you, as the name implies, lines all of the ducts of the lymphatic system. And there's actually a large lymphatic system in the lung that's very active. Um, the endothelium of the lymphatic system is by, by design much leakier than the endothelium of the, of the blood system. And so we became interested in really identifying the endothelial cells of the lung that would be blood endothelium as opposed to lymphatic endothelium. And blood and, 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 and lymphatic endothelium share a lot of markers, uh, but there are some distinctions. So we, we obtained a, uh, a transgenic rat that um, labels all of the lymphatic endothelial cells with uh, EGFP. Um, and these lymphatic endothelial cells ex express a transcription factor called PROX1. So as you can see in this image on the left, in the central portion of the lung is uh, particularly lining the airways is where the majority of the lymphatic endothelium resides and that stains green. And so we were able to develop cell sorting methods whereby we could digest uh, whole rat lungs from these PROX1 GFP rats and really select out the endothelium that was negative for GFP so that we were really getting a purified uh, cell collection of blood endothelium, which would presumably have higher barrier function. When we took these endothelial cells and seeded them into acellular lung scaffolds uh, that we had decellularized in the rat, you can see it in a low power image uh, on the left uh, that we were able to get fairly broad coverage of the microvasculature and the larger vessels in the lung. And you can see on the right, this is, this is an example of, of, micro, of, of end, blood endothelial cell seeding into the acellular lung matrix. And you can see that many of these cells uh, permeate into the small microvasculature in the septae surrounding the alveolars, surrounding the alveoli. When we look at marker expression of these cells that are seeded into the lung, we can see that the blood endothelial cells express a lot of markers that we would expect to see in native microvascular endothelium, including CD31, VE cadherin, um, endothelial nitric oxide synthase, VWF, and also zona occludens 1, which is an important molecule for forming tight junctions and forming barrier in between endothelial cells. And uh, as you can see from this, from this image on the right, when we measure the resistance of the capillary bed, which we're able to do by, by flowing uh, culture medium through, through the vasculature and by measuring pressure drops across the vasculature over time. And we can calculate a cap capillary resistance. What you can see is that over time, as the, as the endothelial cells migrate into the microvasculature and begin to line the conduits, we see that, that uh, the capillary resistance actually goes down over time. And we viewed these as, as sort of positive uh, indicators that, that, uh, that the endothelial cells were adhering to the walls of the, of the uh, vessels and doing what they were supposed to do. We then also uh, performed assays that measured not just the resistance of the vasculature, but also the barrier function. Um, so, you know, one of the key, um, one of the key functions of, of the lung microvasculature and the epithelium is that it forms a tight barrier between the air in the air sacs and the blood in the microvasculature of the lung. Um, and so the ability to recapitulate that barrier function so that you don't get transudation of fluid across the alveolar barrier is really a key aspect of whole lung engineering. And what we found when we measured a barrier function or, or essentially flow rate 
uh, liquid flow rate going across the, the alveolar barrier from the vascular compartment into the airway compartment. Uh, what we found is that flow across that barrier tended to go down over time as the endothelial cells were cultured in the vasculature. And you can see on this image on the right, the, these, these blue uh, squares show that there's a slight decrease in fluid flow across the barrier. Um, and going along with that, that, there's a concomitant increase in vascular flow that, that enters the pulmonary artery and then exits the pulmonary vein. And while these are, are both things that we would like to see, uh, what's important to note is that the flow rate um, in blue boxes here certainly does not go to zero over time. So that means that there's still quite a bit of fluid transudation from the, from the vasculature into the airways. And, um, and th that's, a nice, that, that's a nice way of uh, referring to drowning, actually. So if you, if you put a, a lung that's very leaky into an animal or into a human, then you'll get that fluid transudation into the airways and you'll basically drown the recipient. So, so the, the, the message here is that while, while providing uh, blood endothelial cells into the microvasculature certainly uh, helped with decreasing resistance and increasing barrier, and while it was helpful, in our hands, it was not sufficient. So then that, that caused us to look a little bit more carefully at not just the endothelium on the vascular side, but also to try to understand how the endothelium interacts with other cell types in, in the alveolus to maintain homeostasis and also to try to maintain barrier function. And uh, th this led to a set of experiments that was done by a very talented graduate student in my group, group, uh, group named Katie Leiby. She's an MD PhD student. And uh, what, she, what she wanted to understand was the impact of different cell types, particularly endothelial cells, but also alveolar fibroblasts on the differentiation and the growth of the, the, the epithelial stem cell of the lung, which is really the type two alveolar uh, epithelial cell. So, so in, in our alveoli, there are really two flavors of, of epithelium. There are the type two cells, which make surfactant and which allow our lungs to expand, but they're also the local progenitor cell for the type one epithelium. And the type one ep epithelial cells are the cells that really line most of the surface area of the alveoli and provide a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, barrier function. And so what Katie found um, is that by, by combining um, a, a really uh, a type two epithelial cell conducive medium, combining that with co-culture with both uh, fibroblasts and endothelial cells, she found that she was able to form really dense rings of, of alveoli that were lined almost entirely with type two epithelium, um, which is actually kind of an extraordinary finding um, because it means that she was able to essentially reconstitute the, the epithelial component you know, across an entire organ in a fairly organized fashion. What she also found was that when she just uh, seeded the, the, al the epithelial progenitor cells just with endothelium, that, that, that the growth of the, of the epithelium was poor. And if she seeded them with just fibroblasts, that, that there was a lot of epithelial cell growth, but it was very disorganized. So having these two other cell types was really uh, pivotal for, for generating alveolar structures that contained really robust epithelium. And if we look at this a little bit more closely, um, again, there's, there's some immunostaining here for some markers that, that may not be familiar to some folks if you don't think about lung all the time. But, but essentially what, what this staining shows is that, is that in triculture lungs, um, we got a, a tremendous amount of, of what we would call um, native alveolar markers, uh, including um, uh, type two markers, which is, which is ABCA, ABCA3, um, and also Vimentin and NKX2.1. This just shows even a little bit more detail looking at, looking at the functionality or the ability of these type two cells to make an important uh, molecule, which is surfactant molecule, which allows um, allows our lungs to inflate and, and lowers the, sur the surface tension in our lungs. Surfactant molecules are stored in, in lamellar bodies, and you can see that in triculture, the type 2 cells have huge numbers of lamellar bodies which contain surfactant that's waiting to be released from the cells. 
And uh, when we don't have triculture, we see many fewer of these lamellar bodies. So to finish up, I'm going to focus a little bit on some of our single cell work that has really tried to understand what are the conversations that are going on between the different cells in the alveolus. So this is, a, this is really a, a cartoon of these different cell types that we think are important and are present. Um, as I mentioned, there's the type one epithelial cell, which covers most of the alveolus. There's the endothelium, the blood endothelium, which sits on the other side of the basement membrane. And those two cell types, which cover most of the surface area, are really separated by only about 500 or, or 50 or 100 nanometers. So, so, so it would not be surprising if those two cell types actually had very active conversations with each other. But in addition, there's type 2 cells, there's macrophages, and there's a couple different flavors of fibroblasts. So in order to understand in a very broad way how, how cells in the alveolus talk to each other, um, we really wanted to get a signature of lungness, a signature of, of what the alveolar uh, communication system looks like. And to do that, what we did is, is a single cell analysis of, of the connectomics between cells in the alveolus, but not just in one species. We, act, we actually looked in four species. We looked in mouse, rat, pig, and human, because our goal was to, was to not have species-specific uh, communication algorithms that we were focused on, but really to try to understand what is it about this collection of six different cell types that, that creates homeostasis um, across alveoli, across uh, all of these species, because, you know, a rat alveolus looks a lot like a human alveolus. And so we speculated that, that the signaling would also be similar. And this is just a, one example of one signaling vector that we identified that's certainly not surprising. Um, th this is some single cell data looking at the expression of, of VEGF alpha. And as you can see, most of the VEGF is actually made by this cell cluster here, which is actually the type 1 epithelial cells in the alveoli. Similarly, if you look for the receptor for VEGF, you see that it's, that it's located almost entirely on the vascular endothelium, as you would expect. And so by, by looking at these two sets of data, we can essentially draw a vector that, for a signaling vector that connects the type 1 epithelium to the endothelium in the alveolus. And so we've one of another graduate student in my lab, Sam Reardon, has done terrific work here, looking at um, looking at how we can generate sort of a connectome or or co collection of conversations uh, between these different cell types. And what he's shown is that if you if you look at multiple cell types in the lung, so this is not just the alveolus, but this is cell types even higher up in the airways it's possible to, to draw vectors of communication between these different cell types and then to graph that visually. And as you can see, the, the, the connectomics of, of cell communication in the human lung is actually at a gross level, uh, bears a lot of similarity to the connectomics in the mouse lung, which is shown on the right here. Specifically, the fibroblasts in the alveolus are incredibly important signalers to type one and type two cells in the alveolus, as well as um, to other epithelial cells. And, and that's just one example of a confer, conserved signaling pattern. So we do believe that we're making progress in understanding what are the key signals that, that cells in the alveolus need to talk to each other and to maintain their function and their, and their stability. And we believe that once we're able to tease out this, this roadmap of communication, we'll be able to translate that into our engineered lung system and really provide the right cues so that we can generate alveoli that, that are functional where these five or six different cell types are, are all behaving as they should. So I'll just finish up there. Um, I, I really wanna thank my fabulous group at Yale who's been working on this problem for a long time. <music>